Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And I'm also your host, Carly Bird. Week 16. We've made it four months on this show, which is absolutely insane that we made this part. So we only have eight months left, if I'm not mistaken, until we've made it 12 whole months. Boop, boop. We did it. We really, hey, we're getting there, guys. Sweet 16. So before we get started, and the announcements are going to be quite short today, I just want to let everyone know that we have a website now. You can go to www.spiritsandghoststories.com. And if you really want to make sure you get to our our show, do a straight line. I guess it's a space or whatever, a straight line, no, a slash. It's like a slash, but it's like... A straight line podcast. So www.spiritsandghoststories.com slash podcast. And you can find our website. We have the domain. We own the name Spirits and Ghost Stories, if that helps at all. Um, but I'm pretty excited. Let us know what you think of the website. Um, I think it looks decent. I am not very... I'm, I'm pretty autistic, but not artistic. So, uh, and I made it. So it's okay. Yell at me in the comments section. That makes sense. Let us know what you think. I think it looks pretty dope. Carly, what are we drinking tonight? Our sponsor for tonight's drink is Bluemont Coffee. Uh, we personally know the people who supply this located in Bluemont, Virginia, and we decided to go ahead and make ourselves some Irish coffee this evening. We are using Jameson triple distilled Irish whiskey along with two sugar cube. Mm, it's really good. Per drink. And it's giving me enough energy to keep going at 1030 p.m. So. Whether you are a belligerent alcoholic that needs a little pick-me-up in the morning, or you're a soccer mom that's like, you know what? Little Jimmy's team sucks, but I need a little bit of a buzz. <laughs> Please blend this fantastic coffee with a little Jimmyson. And no matter if it's in the morning or in the late evening, you're going to find what you want. Absolutely. Don't forget to add a little bit of Cool Whip on top. It adds a nice really little good. pizzazz. That's, really, that's a Makes cool you flavor. Think, Mm, Starbucks. It's like doing coffee and it's like doing cocaine and heroin at the same time. Cocaine and heroin. Yeah, it's an up and a downer. It's quite good. Tommy would know all about drugs. I would not, as we've previously previously talked about in uh, other episodes. Well, first off, I am way too fat to have done either <laughs> drug. So, um, so, but <laughs> sorry, that was a little derailed. Uh, so, what's going on with our story tonight? Since oh my gosh, Miss Bird is presenting. Okay. Super excited about this story. It might take a little bit longer than what we're used to, but I've got a lot of material to get through this evening. Our lovely fan on Instagram named Eleanor from Colorado has messaged us and told us about this spooky park in Denver, Colorado called mm. Cheeseman Park. Okay. I don't know if any of our listeners have heard about it before, but... um. Let me just go back real quick, make sure everyone knows. I'm not 100% sure our follower's name is Eleanor. I just know that her IG name is Eleanor. Her so. code name anyway, is Eleanor. Anyway, shout out to Eleanor on- Thank you, Eleanor. On Instagram. We love you. Okay. Um, so uh, I did want to just kind of read this cliff notes about why Cheeseman State Park in Colorado is so spooky. Are you ready? Yes. All right. So here is the backstory. While taking a stroll upon the rolling hills or having a picnic under the shade of one of many trees in the beautiful 80-acre Cheeseman Park, many visitors don't realize that the very they very well may be walking or sitting right upon the grave of one of the many who were buried here in the 19th century. Hmm. Surrounded by Capitol Hill mansions in the heart of downtown Denver, Colorado, Cheeseman Park is not only frequented by visitors wanting to explore its botanical gardens or its jo or to enjoy its 150-mile panoramic view from the pavilion, but is also said to be a home to a number of restless spirits. Wow, okay. I didn't know about this at all. The park's history began in 1858 when General William 
Larimer jumped the claim of the St. Charles Town Company and established his own town, which he called Denver. Hmm. In actuality, the property didn't belong to the town company either. Rather, the land belonged to the, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation of this, Arapaho Indians. Okay, so this is like literally like the story of Polar Guys. They mm-hmm. built it on an Indian barrel ground. This will not end well. No. <laughs> in November 1858, Larimer set aside 320 acres for a cemetery, which is now the site of present day Cheeseman and Congress Parks. Oh boy. Larimer called it Mount Prospect Cemetery, and several large plots were designated on the crest of the hill for the exclusive use of the city's wealthy and most influential citizens. Wow. The outermost edge of the cemetery was reserved for criminals and paupers, while the middle class was to be interred somewhere in between. The first man buried in the cemetery was named Abraham Kay, who died after being suddenly stricken with lung infection. He was buried on March 20th, 1859. However, the most often story told of the person buried was a man hanged for murder, making for a far more interesting tale. It has become one of the most preferred versions. In 1881, a hospital for those suffering from smallpox was established just south of the Jewish cemetery. The hospital more often was referred to as the Pest House, which was where smallpox victims were quarantined, along with others having contagious diseases and some that were merely sick, elderly, or handicapped. Wow. Most Patients were simply left at the pest house to die. Behind the building was the potter's field section of the graveyard, where the vast majority of the dead were buried in mass graves. How do you like, I'm not talking about politics, (laughs) but in today's healthcare system, we all complain. But literally back then, they would board the door shut and let you die. Yep. And then just dig a hole mm-hmm. and this was in the united states and yet it's like i'm not I, I guess perspective it's like yeah i'm not saying like today does have its issues but who in our audience comment below let us know send us an email would be like you know what i want to go back to 1800s <laughs> no who wants to go back to 17 no 16, like, no one would like never it was like, <laughs> even like like <laughs> racism and prejudice aside oh my gosh just the health care everyone lives longer now it's like insane hell no 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 sounds I, miserable I, yeah because literally it just says that they were boarded up in a facility and then you boarded up i <laughs> just just nailed you, you, you said it you said it exactly like that behind the building the potter's field yeah. section of the graveyard they were where the vast majority of the dead were buried in mass graves okay all right, continuing, continuing on with the story. However, most of those buried in the cemetery were vagrants, criminals, and paupers. Huh. When the majority of bodies remained unclaimed, the city of Denver of, awarded a contract to undertaker E.P. McGovern to remove the remains what? in 1893. McGovern was to provide a quote unquote fresh box for each body and transfer it to the Riverside Cemetery at a cost of one point one dollar and ninety cents each. I was gonna say one point ninety because I thought it was gonna be like million. Well the equivalence <laughs> of a dollar fifty back then is probably about six billion now. True inflation. One dollar <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> one dollar ninety cents each. The gruesome work began in on March 14th, 19, I'm sorry, 1893, before an audience of curiosity seekers and reporters. For the first few days, the transfer was orderly. However, the unscrupulous McGovern soon found a way to make an even larger profit oh on the contract. Rather than utilizing full-sized coffins for adults, he used 
child-sized caskets that were just one foot by three and a half feet long, hacking the bodies up. McGovern sometimes used as many as three caskets for just one body. How does that save money? In there, <laughs> remember, it was one ninety each. Oh, okay. yeah. In their That's haste, up. body parts and bones were literally strewn everywhere. And in the disorganized mess, souvenir hunters began to loot the open graves and the coffins. Okay, that's even more fucked up. Okay. When the Denver Republican got a hold of the story, its headline procl proclaimed on March 19th, 1893, The World of Goals. The article described in detail McGovern's practice of hacking up what were sometimes intact remains of the dead and stuffing them into underside boxes. The article in part described the scene thusly. The line of desecrated graves at the southern boundary of the cemetery sickened and horrified everybody by the appearance they presented. Around their edges were piled broken coffins, rent and tattered shrouds, and fragments of clothing that had been torn from the dead bodies. All were trampled into the ground by the footsteps of the grave diggers like rejected junk. Jesus God. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, because of all of that, McGovern was pulled off the job after he had removed about 1,000 of the remaining bodies. Instead of hiring someone else to finish the job properly, the city simply pulled out the remaining headstones. That is a political move and a half. Like, can we finish this job or, hear me out, what if we just swiped it all under the table? It's estimated there are around 3,000 bodies left buried under Cheeseman Park. Good God. Bones are still found regularly at both Cheeseman Park and the Denver Botanic Botanical Gardens during construction projects. If a private citizen did this shit, do you understand the, the complete shit show the that would be The repercussions they would have to do. But then a politician's like, what if we just metaphorically Meh. and quite literally swept this under the Meh. rug? All these dead bodies. That's like... <laughs> That's a lot of bodies. That's not like one or two, like, whoopsie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. The most recent was found in 2010 during irrigation work at the park when workers uncovered four skeletons near the park's pavilion. Oh, my God. Could you imagine that was near the sandbox? I have this weird vision in my head. I have a bunch of little kids playing. It's like, Mommy, Mommy, look what I found. No, no, no. <laughs> you bring that to your mother. Wah! Continue. It comes as no surprise that the spirits of these forgotten, looted, and sometimes desecrated bodies continue to make their presence known, not only at Cheeseman Park, but in the neighborhoods that surround it. Yeah. I it's, mean, Supernatural talked about this, right? You got to burn the bones. It's said that the, you can see little mirages and visions of children running and hiding behind trees. And then when you go to look behind the tree, there's nobody there. There are people that are see-through people walking through the park. And then when the closer you get to the person, the more they just like disintegrate and vanish because it's just a spirit. Damn. That's intense. That's really intense. Sounds like a cool place to visit. So that leads us to our story. The Spirits Near Cheeseman Park. This happened about four years ago. Halloween night at a house not far from Cheeseman Park in Denver, Colorado. I started working for a local real estate agent taking photos for homes for sale. I usually photographed two to four homes a week, lakefronts and shacks alike. I had seen unusual th things like the occasional hidden room or unique art collection left behind, but I had never encountered anything scary until this happened. It was a summer day, warm and bright. I knew the neighborhood was heading to, I knew the neighborhood I was heading to, and I had no concern about safety. The area was very suburban for the mountain with a large park and school nearby. I packed up my camera and drove 20 minutes to the home. 
Upon arrival, I began my session by taking pictures of the exterior. Nothing was out of the ordinary. After struggling to navigate the sharp slope the home was on, I managed to snap its sides and rear deck. It was time now for interior shots. I proceeded to the front, entered the box box code, and tried to unlock the front door. As I fumbled with it, I felt overwhelmingly uncomfortable. Something washed over me in that moment, and mm-hmm. I knew I shouldn't have been there. I finally... You're either about to get raped by a serial killer or there's a ghost. Because <laughs> your body has a biological instinct that there's something wrong. You ever been in the ocean and you feel like something's weird? You're out in the woods or in Detroit, like any of those things, and you're like, something's not right. <clears throat> it's your body saying, get the hell out of there, woman. Get out, get out, get out. So, I finally opened the door and I found a house completely destroyed. Whoa. The living room Detroit. was a <laughs> sea of debris and an, an EMT board laid in the middle with a charred doll beside it. What the heck? Holes littered the walls. <clears throat> Light bulbs were f- smashed all over. What part of Colorado is this again? <laughs> it's right by Cheeseman Park, Denver. Huh? I don't know much about Denver, Colorado, but I think we're learning a little bit. Oh, yeah. It was a scene straight of a, out of a horror movie. I observed all of this without taking a single step further. I immediately, cl- immediately closed the door walked to my car as fast as I could and called the agent. I told the agent that she would need to find someone else to take the pictures of the house. She asked why, and I tried to explain it to her. I realized I sounded a little crazy. Just be whack, yo. How can you professionally describe to someone the feeling of being scared shitless for no apparent reason other than a disgustingly filthy house? She told me she had seen homes that were less than welcoming, but we both had a job to do, and she couldn't complete hers without me doing mine. Fair enough. I left the property, but decided I didn't want to lose my job over this. I called my father, who lived locally, and asked if he'd accompany me to the house. In all my days, I had never heard my dad discuss anything remotely spooky. He had a very no-nonsense kind of... He was a very no nonsense nonsense old school, kind of man blue collar type right of old yeah. school blue collar yeah yeah he was like it is what it is kind of man and simply wouldn't tolerate talk of ghosts or yeah. witches therefore i thought he'd be perfect for this assignment he'd keep my head in the game for sure i arranged to pick him up at his house in 30 minutes my heart sank a little as i pulled into my parents house and my dad's truck was gone My mom came running out, purse in hand, to tell me that my father had to leave for work for reasons, but that she'd go with me instead. Most dads are like that, yep. I brought along a flashlight and... It's now you and your mother. She assured me that I'd be just fine. This is your mother. It is. As we drove to the house, I described to her what had happened. Her cheeriness level came down a few notches, and I could tell she was slightly unnerved. This is not the house of the Lord, huh? We parked parked in front of the house, and I knew she didn't want to go inside. I didn't want her to, either. She came up with a solution. She'd call my cell phone and talk to me as I walked through the house. Why is she there? She's pointless. This is... She's pointless! Oh, God. She'd stand right outside the front door. But, okay, I'm sorry. If you're a mom, this is literally your daughter. I'm assuming moms care about the daughters. I don't, I wouldn't know. It, she invites you to come because the house freaks her out and there's nobody home and it might be haunted. So you go because you know she's scared. But then you get to this point where it's like, listen, I am so scared by this shit show you're going into. I will still let you do the thing but I'm going to give you a phone call. Right. At that point, parental... I I, I am very suspect of your parenteling <laughs> skills. Uh, anyway, she'd stand right outside of the front door. I answered her call, turned on my flashlight, and headed in. Again, immediately upon entering, I was scared. Yeah. And just for clarification here, I'm not easily scared. 
I'm not one to see or feel things of that nature, ever. So the fact that I was actually feeling something terrified me. By this time, it was later in the day and the house was was, was positioned in such a way that it was completely shaded from the sun. Hmm. The electricity was off and it was dark, very dark. My mother was on the phone telling me to breathe. I can't hear you breathing. Are you that scared? Is it that bad? I had a hard time speaking as I took in all that I saw. The toilets were completely black on the inside. That is never a good sign. Amityville Horror 2.0. The kitchen had blackish, reddish smears all over the counters. Children's toys were mixed in with porn magazines lying on the floor. I just kept clicking. How the hell are you going to sell this house? (laughs) Trying to focus on any one of them. The deeply disturbing things of the house. Trying not to focus. Wait, wait, wait. You remind me, is she a criminal investigator or is she working for a real estate agent? She's working for a real estate agent taking photos of the house. What's her, what's Sadie's mom's name? Lauren McBain. I'm talking to you right now. Don't her last name. Okay, Lauren blah, blah, blah. Talking to you right now. Could you sell a house that had basically a murder that happened into it? Please, I'd really like to know of that right now. Of course they can. But the funny is, like, if I gave you <laughs> I gave you pictures of a place. Of a crime real, scene. Any real we estate agent. We gave you agent. pictures of a crime scene. Could you sell that crime scene? And the fact that the, that the real estate agent talks to the photographer is like, listen, like the photographer's talking to the real estate agent. It's like, like you got to do your job so I could do my job. There are dead bodies Yo. in here. Listen, It sucks. <laughs> It's not ideal, but we got jobs to do. <laughs> Who is going to be on Realtor.com looking at these these photos like, all right, all right, all right. oh, God, that's terrible. Ooh, Porn. that's and a Dr. nice Seuss. one. And Dr. Seuss. That's not a good combo. No, no. I look at there, look in there. There's porn over there. There's porn over there. Blood and leverage everywhere. Continue. <laughs> I just kept clicking, trying not to focus on any one of the deeply disturbing things inside the house. I went as quickly as I could through the main level. I then came to a set of stairs leading down. I told my mother through the cell phone that I was heading down. She continued to reassure me and told me to hurry up and get it over with. I know. Help. There are dead people everywhere. It's okay, hon. You got this. The Lord's with you. I began walking extremely cautiously down the steps, one at a time. The steps led to a landing and then turned the corner, so all I could see was a white wall at the bottom. I had this immense feeling that I was going to see something horrific once I turned that corner. (laughs) I was two or three steps away from the landing when I heard it. A scream coming from my phone. Not a mild scream, but a blood-curdling scream. Like something or someone was being murdered on the other end of the line. My mom. I have never ran, nor have I since, as fast as I did running up those stairs. I completely expected to find my mom laying lifeless just outside the house. I got to the top of the stairs and there she was, standing there looking completely terrified and perplexed. I grabbed her hand and we ran to the car. We drove for nearly five minutes before one of us said anything. She turned to me and said, tell me why you were screaming. I told her that I thought it was her. Neither of us were screaming, but both of us for a certainty, had heard a woman screaming for her life on that phone. We stopped at a grocery store parking lot and just sat there trying to catch our breath. When I got home, I uploaded the pictures without actually looking at them and sent them to the real estate agent. I told her she'd have to do the editing on her own, as I would not have them on my computer. I then deleted the email and every single image. Because of that, I don't know the address of the house, nor have I driven by it since. In hindsight, I would have liked to research the history of the property. Alas, I'll never know what happened there. How much was she getting paid per hour? Because she she had commitment to an extent. It had to have been decent money. 
I mean, I don't know. Like, I get the whole joke, like, 20 bucks is 20 bucks. But when you're going into a murder house, it's like, you got to have some 401k benefits to be willing to do that. I don't know. But if it's a creepy house that have you've Mike been Rowe. told nobody lives there, like, just go take some pictures. A creepy house. And yeah, you get your paycheck. some blood. It's, it's okay. Go in there. It's a murder scene, by She the way. didn't know it was blood. It, yeah. When you... When you the line you used was there's porn and Ch- Dr. Seuss mixed in and blood everywhere. It's like, oh, hmm. probably shouldn't go down the creepy staircase more. Blackish, reddish. Yeah. But that's blood. why delete everything? Because she didn't want it on her computer because she felt like because she felt it was satanic. And if you have that kind of stuff on your computer, satanic, um, witchcraft Mm -hmm. you know all of that if you you know the heebie-jeebie feeling that it Mm -hmm. leaves you with this the same type of feeling that that movie off netflix give you netflix gives you like um the movie that we watched what was it called which one the one where the guys are going, they're hiking, and their friend died at the oh, store. Oh, I'm sorry. The Ritual. The Ritual. Oh, my gosh. I swear, every single time I watch it, it leaves me with this this hippie GB feeling, like, literally for the next four to five days. It's just like, oh, gives you chills mm-hmm. because it is so- Well-written. Well-written, well but also, like, well satanic shit going on witchcraft they're worshiping this god and having sacrificial shit Ugh. gross 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 gross, gross. Yeah, I, mean, I can tell it to a lot of people like the idea of, of a demon or a devil is very um unsettling yeah and yeah i'm mean, clearly with <clears throat> excuse me with the backstory of this thing i 100 i get it i was just curious like to just delete everything and then delete contact with the person wouldn't have definitely gone there. No, no, like, contact. Oh, yeah. No, she never said she deleted contact with the person. I'm sorry. It sounded like it. But, no, she was uh, just like, hey, I'm detaching myself from these photos. Don't it. ask me any more questions. I did what I did. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm never going back there. Period. And and huge story. shout out. Mom of the year. Like, listen, you think your child's going to get murdered here. I won't go in with you to give it back up. Right. But if I you hear, hear her you screaming, get murdered, I know. She literally heard her scream on the phone. Then I'll and come in. stands outside. She just, she stays outside. She's like, mm, surely she's coming back outside. Yeah. Then I'll come into the house after I think bad stuff has happened. Not like I'm going to be preventative. And yeah. Father of the year award, by the way. What the heck? You know, oh yeah, father of the war. Crazy woman. <gasps> just a crazy woman. <sighs> Going there by yourself. Goodness gracious. Just gotta go take care of something at work. But I'm telling you, I don't care. Like I know it's really hard right now. This is a uh, this is November of 2021. And it's really hard to find a job unless you have the proper like like resume and shit. You should hire this person because clearly I don't think she was getting paid enough. And I don't think she had health insurance or 401k. And she was willing to go into this freaking murder dungeon and take pictures with a terrible employee. This person is loyal, and if you just give her some health benefits, I bet she would mm. take down the mafia for you. Oh, yeah. Impressive stuff by this yep. lady. 401ks, health benefits. Great story. That was a really good story. And then, um, again, Carly, tell everyone thank you to who? Thank you so much, Eleanor, for reaching out on thank you, Instagram Eleanor. to our Spirits and Ghost Stories Instagram. We love you. We love all all the feedback that all of our fans give us mm. and um, especially these awesome stories like yeah, this. Stories like are really she good. sent us the link to um, that kind of cliff note version mm. that I sent you as to the history behind yeah. um, the Cheeseman Park in Denver, Colorado. And so I really appreciate that. So that I kind of spook Thomas. Yeah, that was a that was a scary story. That was that was a really good story. And and yeah, yeah thank you so much again for for sending this out. If you guys email us or you reach out to us on any way, we are going to get back to you. You know, we're trying to grow a community, a community of people that like like to 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 drink different things and to connect with loved ones over stories. And that's what this is all about. So please, if you have a drink recipe or a fun story, share it. We want to share it with the community. We want to grow something here that that really matters. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was a short, sweet to the point type of week. And, uh, you know, thank you guys so much for tuning in. This was 16 weeks in the book Yep. and it is a shorter episode. So I can give you a little teaser because next week I, Thomas Aarons, you know, <laughs> the orator you guys all like to uh, shit on online, he will be speaking in and this week or that week, 
This week or that week. <laughs> the week coming up. Next week. I am doing a terrible job of getting myself a promotion. Next week. Next week in the books. <gasps> Appalachia. The Appalachian Mountains Ooh. and witchcraft. Ooh. Did you know witchcraft? There is a great history of witchcraft in the United States, going back all the way to the Pilgrims. Yeah, and how Appalachia is a deep-rooted belief in this thing called granny magic and witchcraft that came back from Europe. Granny magic. I don't know if I have a really spooky story, and maybe this is more of a cultural story because that's one thing we're going to get into here as we transition into different seasons. Okay. But you guys are going to learn a lot about witchcraft in the Appalachians. That's coming next week, week 17, here on Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Carly Bird. Until next time. We'll see you next time, guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.